Kia koutou katoa. Good afternoon. I'm joined by the Minister for Sport, Grant Robertson, to celebrate New Zealand's incredible success at the Commonwealth Games. First to the week ahead. This week I am in Wellington on Tuesday and Wednesday for the House. On Tuesday, we welcome the United States Deputy Secretary of State, Wendy Sherman. I'll have the opportunity to meet with Ms Sherman and Ministers Nash and McAnulty will sign memorandums of understanding in the areas of space cooperation and emergency management. On Thursday, I'll make a regional visit with a focus on infrastructure and economic recovery. On Friday, I'm in Auckland for a series of meetings and visits. Today, I want to acknowledge our 233 New Zealand athletes as they take part in their final day of competition at the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham. We are undoubtedly a country that sources an enormous amount of pride from the performance and conduct of our sports people, and these games have been no different. What also makes me proud is the diversity of the team. It includes the highest female representation to date, 53%. 20% of the team is Māori, and we have strong Pacific numbers too. Para-athletes and non-disabled athletes are once again competing side by side at the Games with the largest ever para programme. In Birmingham 2022, with 4,500 athletes from 72 nations and territories for 11 days of spectacular sport, is this year making global sport history by becoming the first ever major multi-sport event to award more medals to women than men. As you'll know, overnight the Birmingham Commonwealth Games became our most successful yet taking into account our gold tally. Our record number of gold medals at a Commonwealth Games was broken with another gold for Aaron Gate after a spectacular sprint finish in the men's road race. With our recent performance here and at the Summer and Winter Olympics, we are in a golden era of high performance sport in New Zealand and it has been truly remarkable to witness. I've been fortunate enough to have been kept well up to date from our Minister on the Ground, Deputy Prime Minister and Sports Minister, Grant Robertson. So I'm going to hand over to the Minister now, who I understand was able to indulge his inner sports reporter while at uh, the Games. Minister Robertson. Uh, always good to have options. Thank you, uh, <laughs> Prime Minister. Can I start by saying it was an absolute privilege to be able to be at the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham to support our athletes and para-athletes and to see them perform so well. I, also, I want to thank and acknowledge the whole New Zealand team for their achievements, and in particular, Chef to Mission Nigel Avery, uh, New Zealand Olympic Committee President Mike Stanley, CE Nikki Nicol and their whole team, and High Performance Sport New Zealand and their teams for their leadership that focused on athlete wellbeing both before and during the event. It has been a truly exceptional Games for New Zealand. As the Prime Minister has said, 48 medals so far and a 49th that will either be gold or silver to come overnight. Night. Um, these have, medals have come from a wide range of sports. The 19 gold so far coming in mountain biking, track cycling, road cycling, swimming, athletics, and squash. And other medals coming in sports as diverse as judo, bowls, boxing, triathlon, wrestling, weightlifting, I'm sure Ellen will be loving this, rugby, cricket, and netball. At an individual level, as the Prime Minister just said, Aaron Gates' performance in the road race last night was exceptional, taking his fourth gold medal and becoming the first New Zealander to win four golds at a Games. Elise Andrews and Lewis Clearbit both earned three medals, equaling the previous record in a single Games. We can be proud of all our medalists, but also our whole team. There were some who, while they didn't make the podium, did break their own or New Zealand records. And I do want to mention in particular Sam Tanner. Sam had a massive personal best of 3 minutes 31 in the 1500 metres, the second fastest 1500 metres run by a New Zealander ever. He came sixth in a world-class field and at 21 years of age represents a new generation of athletes who have emerged at this Games, giving us huge optimism for the future. Our team also represented us well when they were competing, but also in their sportsmanship and values. A great example of this that I witnessed was shot putter Jack O'Gill, who before he celebrated his silver medal, went up to every official who had worked on the event and shook their hand and thanked them. I'm told he has done this at every event he has competed in for many years, and it was a moment of true humility and sportsmanship. 
There was a change in the Commonwealth Games Federation guidelines for these games, which allowed athletes to advocate for causes. And I want to highlight our gold medal winning mountain biker Sam Gaze and his advocacy for mental health. He said before the games that he would be racing for mental health awareness and he wore the green ribbon at his podium event. It is great for athletes to have the ability to advocate for causes that are import important to them and I want to applaud Sam for doing so at these games. There are still a few hours to go in the game so the best of luck to all our athletes who will be performing overnight and to all of the New Zealand team, well done. Every one of you has made New Zealand proud. Minister. Thank you, Minister. We've, as the Minister has said, seen exceptional performances across the board. And there have been many memorable moments. I'm sure these will be shared in October when New Zealand team athletes from the Tokyo Olympic Games, Beijing Olympic Games and Birmingham Commonwealth Games will join together for a celebration. This will be led by the New Zealand Olympic Committee and I understand they'll release more details tomorrow morning. Ahead of that, I can share today that some of our athletes will be warmly welcomed home this Thursday, the 11th of August, at Auckland Airport. The New Zealand Olympic Committee tells me the public is welcome to meet our returning athletes at the Auckland Airport International Arrivals Hall as they come off their 11.20 a.m. and 12.20 p.m. flights. And that, again, is this Thursday at the Auckland International Arrivals Hall. Team New Zealand, you've made us proud and we can't wait to welcome you home. We're happy to take questions. Um, Mr Robertson, uh, Sports Minister. Very welcome. Oh, thank you. I don't want to be a dippy downer, but... Um, <laughs> oh, there was, go for your life, though, <laughs> Barry. Welcome. There were, there were complaints uh, in uh, Birmingham that if you look at the comparison between the Australia swim team and the New Zealand swim team, they get about $30 million, whereas um, we're lucky to scratch up a million. Will that sort of thing be looked at? Yeah, so recently, Barry, we have re-looked at the funding for High Performance Sport New Zealand, and actually that's partly what led to an increase in funding for swimming. Uh, so swimming was being funded, I think, around about three quarters of a million dollars, and now is over just over a million dollars for it, for this part of its high performance program. What we've done is looked not just at the previous criteria we've had, which has largely been based on previous medal winning performance. We've added in what's called an aspiration fund now for sports that perhaps haven't won so many medals, but we think there are good prospects for the future, and swimming has been a recipient of that additional funding. Uh, we made a decision, or High Performance Sport New Zealand made a decision to give certainty through to the Paris Games in 2024, so we've now set that funding. Uh, but we always continue to look for opportunities to support individual athletes who are on a particular programme or their coaches, and I'm sure after the performances at this Games, some of that will be reviewed heading into Paris. Prime Minister, under the government, has, have young people on the job seeker benefit been given a free ride? Absolutely not. And I think any suggestion of that does a disservice to our young people. You know, we have seen that, uh, yes, when we have hard economic times, it is often those areas where our young people are employed that bear the brunt of that. But we've also seen record exits into work. And our young people have been, for instance, uh, in large numbers coming through programmes like Mana and Mahi, have come through He Potamarangatahi, programmes designed to support our young people into work, and they have been taking those opportunities. If I may, just last week I was visiting a work site where there were a number of young people who through Mana and Mahi have been placed in employment, uh, and we see roughly 90% of those who are part of Mana and Mahi generally uh, staying in work. You know, this to me uh, is an example of young people taking up those opportunities and that extra support making a difference. How would you describe National's proposed policy changes to job seeker benefits for young people? Look, a number of the things that we've seen the opposition propose already exist. And so that then leads me to the question of what is truly behind the proposals that they're making. A lot of it you see in the language. We take a very different approach. We need to make sure that we're removing barriers to work. For a large number of our young people, it may be, for instance, access to skills and training, basic things like driver licensing. Those are all things that we have put in place alongside more case management to support young people into work. I'd rather focus on tangible things that make a difference on the ground rather than the rhetoric and the politicking. $1,000 bonus, though, that's tangible. Uh, and again, in Mana and Mahi, we already have incentive payments for those who are accessing the programme and staying in work to support their long-term connection to work. Again, as I've said, 
A number of the things that have been proposed are already in place. What is different is the way that we choose to talk about our young people, their potential, and the motivation I see to get into long-term work. What do the mana and mahi incentive payments, what do they add? They are, in my recollection is that they are actually higher than that rate, depending on the length of time that you've been in the roles. I'm happy to go and, and double-check. Just on the mana and, and mahi yeah, program, go ahead. Um, most up-to-date MSD figures that we have show just 14% of, of mana and mahi participants were on a benefit longer than 12 months. So can you really say that that program is, is getting people off welfare and into meaningful work? 60% of those who are placed through mana and mahi are young people. 90% of them uh, are staying, uh, overall, of those who are coming through mana and mahi are staying off benefits. Keep in mind, the majority of our young people who are currently on JobSeeker um, uh, have been for less than 12 months. So it would naturally follow that you see a higher proportion of them coming through those programs. But just to give you an example, a while ago I used to receive regular case studies when we first started Mana and Mahi because I wanted to see how it was performing in the real world. And I remember seeing the case of a young person who had been on government support uh, for a longer period of time because of mental health issues. Mana and Mahi had helped support them into uh, a work opportunity that was accompanied by training and the extra support that was wrapped around that young person had meant that they had stayed in work and for the first time felt like that was going to be a job placement that would stick. You know, I've seen meaningful outcomes from these programs because they are intensive and they are making a difference. But so there's been some success in the programs you have running, but is there anything more you could do in terms of targeted support for young people who've been on a benefit for more than a year, like job coaches? You know, so we already have, for instance, in our youth services, um, those kinds of initiatives already. Uh, things like driver licensing for roughly 70% of entrant level jobs often requiring driver licensing. And many of our young people will not, for a range of reasons, have access to driver licensing, often because of the barrier financially uh, to, um, to do so and the extra support of, for instance, driver training. So in the last budget, uh, we put additional funding in to support access to driver, driver's licensing, and we know that is making a difference um, as well. Uh, I think probably one of the things that we need to keep doing is making sure that employers know that there are strong incentives in place through mana and mahi, which financially supports the employer, and through flexi wage, where roughly a third of our participants are young people. Uh, those financial incentives, I think, help encourage our employers to come through MSD to work with us to place young people and get a bit of extra support while they do. Those are the kinds of, I think, initiatives that will continue to make a difference. Prime Minister, with all this talk of the golden era of New Zealand sport, yes. what, in your opinion, is the matter with the All Blacks? <laughs> <laughs> Would, yes, I thought that might come to me. Uh, as you know, uh, Ben, one of the things about... Uh, you took joy in asking that question. <laughs> I heard it in your tone. Yeah, as, I was going to say, as you know, Ben, there's swings and roundabouts when it comes to uh, performance of international rugby teams. Uh, no, look, the Minister of Sport, or the Prime Minister for that matter, um, doesn't get into the business of commenting specifically. I think all All Black fans would be wishing uh, that the All Blacks are performing better than they are now, and uh, uh, we'll all be hoping for a better result next weekend. Can I ask that instead with my Jason Wall's waste watch hat on, <laughs> would you ensure that no public money goes to paying out sacked coaches? Oh, look, I, the, the All Blacks, the funding model for the All Blacks is that very little government money goes to the All Blacks per se. The funding that does go from the government to New Zealand rugby is largely aimed at grassroots rugby, also supporting the development of women's rugby. So um, I, that's simply not the financial model that applies. Bennett. Oh, sorry. Bennett. Um, Prime Minister, um, what's your view of um, China's um, live firing uh, uh, in the Taiwan Strait mm. and various other measures mm. um, to um, protest at Nancy Pelosi's You will have seen that uh, the conclusion of a number of international engagements that the Minister of Foreign Affairs has recently engaged in uh, the release of her, her statement, which I'll restate um, again here. New Zealand continues to stand by our long-standing One China policy. Uh, but we have, of course, expressed, as have many others, a concern around the escalation that we've seen, um, uh, the use of ballistics uh, and the increasing tension around the Taiwan Strait. Uh, we, again, as others have done so, call for diplomacy and dialogue and a complete focus on de-escalation. It is in no one's interest uh, to see that escalation continue.
former Prime Minister um, John Key said that Nancy Pelosi had been provocative. Um, what's, what's your view on whether this was something that could have been avoided by um, her not going? Yeah, and, and here I see no added value in entering into a space where we commentate on the diplomacy of others. Don't think New Zealand would particularly appreciate that if that occurred for, for us and our, our decision making uh, and our execution of our independent foreign policy. Um, but again, where we are very firm uh, is that dialogue and diplomacy at this point in time in our minds is key. Uh, we have not changed our uh, long-standing One China policy. But within that, of course, we are we are calling on all parties for a de-escalation. So what would you think of David Seymour going to um, Taiwan? And, and does anyone in the government plan on visiting? Mm. Uh, I think as we were traversing last week, it's been since the um, late 1990s, uh, since you will have seen uh, what I would describe as a uh, as what might be considered a senior government member on a visit. New Zealand, of course, uh, uh, engages uh, with Taiwan economically through, for instance, existing fora like um, APEC and so on, and will continue to do so. But it's been a number of decades since you will have seen a high-level visit of that nature. My recollection is it was uh, what was then called, I believe, International Trade Minister, and I believe it may have been Lockwood Smith, so quite some time ago. Advise other party leaders and Keep in mind, there have been uh, over the years members of parliament and parliamentary delegations that have ex ha that have made visits and exchanges. So that wouldn't be new. Um, but of course, what is of interest to us is uh, the way that we engage diplomatically at a senior government level. Uh, it, it's not for me to give instruction to other party members uh, of of parliament because, of course, there have been regular exchanges in that regard for some time. Prime Minister. Uh, yeah, if I'm, I might give us around a little, Barry, if I may look. Uh, Prime Minister, one for both you and um, Grant Robertson. Mm. National's newest, newest MP, um, stuff reported this afternoon, Stan, Sam Uffendale um, got um, asked to leave King's College when he was there um, because him and some other boys beat up a younger boy, including with a bed leg. He says that the National Party knew about this during the selection process. Get a comment? Uh, I'll, I'll jump in on, on that one. I imagine that as, a, as Labour leader, that's where you might be um, directing that one. I, I take the same position I always have when it comes to the conduct of uh, other MPs and other parties. Um, ultimately, the, the conduct of um, candidates or indeed members of parliament uh, will be for uh, the party's leader, and in this case, obviously, Christopher Luxon. <laughs> Oh, yeah, no, I don't have anything to add to that, um, other than perhaps to make a, a very general comment that, of course, violence and um, attacks on young people are, are things that we should all um, be very concerned about. Isn't there a hypocrisy charge, though, if he's campaigning on anti-violence and anti-gang? Uh, look, again, you know, obviously, Will, we're each responsible for our relative position on policies, um, those things that we campaign on, and equally the conduct of our MPs. Um, but I have always maintained a, a clear distinction that, yes, as leaders, we need to be accountable for our members, our members' conduct, uh, and, so, and what we know of our members' conduct. But again, it is for each party leader to hold that responsibility. Prime Minister, yeah. and then I'll come to you back. Should these sorts of things get picked up, though, in the selection process? Oh, look, I can only speak to the way that we operate. Um, certainly, uh, you know, our... Uh, goal as a party is to make sure that we have members of parliament that are representative of our communities, that have standing within their communities, uh, and that uh, fill a range of skill sets that we believe are necessary to do a good job representing all New Zealanders in this place. Uh, of course, you also want to make sure that where there are issues that, um, to the best of our ability, we do draw those out so that we can be aware, uh, and that may mean that someone is not selected, or it may mean that we uh, work to ensure that there is a, a level of transparency around those issues. That, that is for us. Uh, again, it is up to the National Party and ultimately Chris Luxon and the party leadership how they conduct their own affairs. Prime Minister, Harry. what do you say to the people in Rotorua who are fed up with uh, motels being used in that city for the homeless? Twelve motels are asking for an extension uh, five years uh, for that sort of use. Do you, uh, more than uh, three and a half thousand submissions have been made opposing it. 
Do you feel for the people of Rotorua? So, so two things that we, of course, have a responsibility anywhere in the country to ensure that we are trying to achieve for local communities. The first is ensuring that, uh, that our, our families and our communities are housed. Uh, and we know that in Rotorua, that's an example of where we've had a region where there's been a significant surge in demand for housing and there hasn't been the level of social and public housing to meet that need. And so that's why the response has been, rather than see uh, family members and children in particular without housing or with completely inappropriate housing, while there has been, particularly through COVID, the utilisation of things like um, uh, motels. Uh, I know there's been concern locally over whether or not there have been people coming in to Rotorua in order to access that. I know some work was done to try and understand if that was the case, and my recollection is that the vast majority, roughly 85%, are either hail from Rotorua or have connection uh, to um, the, the area and region. Uh, when it comes to contracts in the future, uh, there's a part to play and uh, roles for a range of different players on that, so it's not just a question for central government over um, those contracts and so on. Uh, but what we do know is that we have to prepare ourselves for the fact that as tourism returns, there will be interest for some of those operators to go back to their primary purpose. So that's why you've seen things like our Housing Acceleration Fund, which is seeking in Rotorua to see about an extra 3,000 houses provided. That's why we're focusing on increasing the supply in regions like that. Mister, just on dental yeah. care, why isn't dental care accessible to every Kiwi living here in New Zealand? We know that we have a large amount of demand in our health services. We've been working very hard, for instance, to increase things like Pharmac funding. We've done that by uh, over 40 per cent now. We, need that, we know that we need to ensure that we have greater access to primary health care, mental health care. There is also need in dental. Where we made a pledge at the election that we would increase our support was, for instance, on dental grants through the Ministry of Social Development. We've done that. It's gone from $300 to $1,000 kicking in in December. But we know that it is one of the areas where there is high need, but there is a lot of demand in health that we equally need to meet. Will there be more investment for adults uh, getting dental care under Te Whatu order? So the, we've already set out where our focus is for dental health care. For those lowest income New Zealanders, we wanted them to be able to access grants. We've done that up to $1,000 kicking in from December. We also know that actually fluoridation makes the biggest difference for young people and teenage, for instance, going into the future uh, and then oral, their oral health care. We've made changes to ensure that there is a health-based approach through the Director General on that issue. And the final area is improving care and access for children. And we've got a number of programs in place. And over time, we've seen fillings reduce as a result of some of those programs. Prime Minister, the, the Auditor yeah. General has made a su his submission to uh, the Finance and Expenditure Select Committee on the um, Water Services Entities Bill and raises very serious concerns around accountability, transparency, lack of local engagement, and a concern that the office itself will not be able to audit those new entities as effectively as it can local authorities. I mean, is there still room for, for change to that model? Yeah, um, Brent, the I mean... The Infrastructure Minister happens to also <laughs> be present with me today. Yeah, Brent, I haven't had an opportunity to read the submission in full yet, and obviously we always take seriously comments that the Auditor-General makes. Uh, the comments that, that he appears to be making based on the, the news story I read on it is around effectively accountability arrangements. Of course, we'll take a look at his suggestions there. Uh, Obviously, when we're moving from a situation where you have up to 70 local authorities involved in the provision of water services and you're bringing it down into a into a uh, four entities, that will mean significant change in the kind of accountability arrangements. But our goal is still that those entities are accountable to their communities. Um, we will have that via the representative groups that appoint members of their board that also set their performance expectations documents and no doubt all of those uh, local authorities involved in that um, will have some considerable say and influence. So, you know, we'll look at a way of doing that, but I'd, at the overall premise that uh, this is taking away from, from communities, we obviously disagree with that because uh, they still are the ultimate owners of these assets.
Prime Minister. Minister. Yeah, uh, Adam. Yes, that's the yes. one. Um, not wanting to take away of the achievements from our athletes, do you think it's appropriate to call or to say that we're in this golden era of high performance sport, given the conversation we had about the quality of high performance sport following Olivia Popmore's tragic passing? Yeah, yeah. Look, um, I think the Prime Minister is reflecting what has been exceptional performances over the course of of Tokyo, Beijing, and and then here. That's not to say everything's perfect in the world of high performance sport, and we have to continue to make a put a focus on athlete well being. Um, there are clear recommendations from the review that has been done, the independent review, both Cycling New Zealand and High Performance Sport New Zealand have committed to implementing uh, those uh, recommendations and we take them very, very seriously. What we're celebrating today is the performance of the athletes, many of whom from that cycling program, many of whom who were friends of Olivia Podmore. And I think today is a good day to celebrate that success and then we'll build on that. And as I noted at the beginning of my comments, you know, one of the things I was really impressed about when I was in Birmingham was seeing the way that athlete wellbeing was absolutely at the centre of the way the team came together. And I think that's something really positive to take forward. I don't for a moment wish to diminish the experience of any athlete uh, or their family members uh, within any of the organisations uh, and uh, uh, any of the process that's underway with those organisations. As the Minister has said, what we're seeking to do here today is acknowledge the individual sporting performances within the Games and the outcomes that they've delivered. I don't think that uh, for a moment takes away from where we know we need to continue to do work to support our athletes in all codes. One, one thing that might be of interest is when I was in Birmingham, I met with a, a number of people from sporting bodies around the world, including my UK ministerial counterpart, and they had just had a release of a, a high-performance sport review. It happened to be in, into gymnastics in their case. Mm. And it did indicate that there are issues around the world, around mm. athlete wellbeing, around mm. the way that high-performance programs are run. And so New Zealand's not alone in this. We're taking the recommendations of, of that review and others very seriously and starting to see some positive change, but we've got to keep following through on it. Just on another matter, reading about uh, Sam Uffendale's link to bullying, has that thrown up any memories of bullying that you, you two have endured in your youth? Uh, I, I certainly over the years witnessed bullying. Um, uh, I don't consider myself to have had... Uh, uh, the extreme circumstances that I've either witnessed, heard, or seen. Uh, I was a board of trustees representative at my school on my school board, uh, where our school was a little bit different, and I was on the suspension committee. Uh, and I saw some pretty, you know, some pretty difficult circumstances brought before that board. Uh, and there's no question, some of our young people in school have a horrific experience. Uh, I think everyone through the education system will have either witnessed or potentially experienced that themselves. And we have, I think, as uh, political leaders, a duty of care to try and ensure that our young people today, uh, where we know actually there are some, particularly our rainbow community, mm -hmm. uh, who have a particularly difficult experience in their younger years. We see that in their self-harm statistics. We see it in the mental health statistics to do everything we can to make sure that our education system is better than it was um, when they experienced it. Yeah, and from, from my perspective, um, yeah, I think I was probably uh, the victim of low-level bullying um, when I was um, a younger person. Um, there is a spectrum here, isn't there, between uh, low-level mm. bullying and assault, mm. and um, I certainly wasn't the victim of that. Minister, can I ask you about Wendy Sherman's visit tomorrow? Yeah, absolutely. Um, she's announced in Tonga that she's intending to invite Pacific Nations to a summit at the White House, um, or maybe the President has that invitation, she's just related. Um, is New Zealand going to go to that in September? And what will your message to her be tomorrow when you meet? Yeah, so look, some, some commentary I'll leave till, till tomorrow if I may. Um, but I think what will be useful for us um, tomorrow is, yes, undoubtedly we'll engage on the current... Uh, circumstances we find in our region, uh, uh, current tensions uh, and escalation uh, in uh, the wider region, um, but also will be a chance to reflect on some of the recent engagements that the United States has been having in the Pacific and our own reflections on our region. Uh, we've been really consistent, though. Our view is that the United States, there has been a period where some of the engagement has fluctuated. We see 
a really clear commitment uh, um, through the current administration. Uh, we'll be calling for that to be consistent and that ongoing engagement uh, for the benefit of, of our wider region. Do you see the response now, we've got a couple of tours coming around and now this summit, to have been commensurate with, with the charge that the new the United States has been neglectful in the Pacific? Yeah, our, our um, consistent message has been the Pacific is really clear on its priorities. So that's a starting point for engagement. Uh, and those priorities include, for instance, climate adaptation and mitigation. Uh, it also includes uh, issues that are considered of regional security, such as the protection of major income and protein sources, fishing. Uh, the Blue Pacific is a region where, you know, it's very difficult to ensure ongoing rigorous surveillance and yet fishing uh, presents uh, one of the most significant income sources for many of our neighbours and yet is also the subject of illegal, illegal fishing. Uh, and so here we've seen engagement on the likes of the Tuna Treaty that's been really important to the region, but ongoing support around maritime surveillance uh, and uh, wider security there I think is another example of a priority. Um, I might just, you know, just to finish, the uh, mana in Mahi uh, has a $3,000 incentive payment that is uh, able to be accessed over the course of 52 weeks and up to as many as three payments. All right, I think we'll finish there. Thanks, everyone.